Welcome to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Juliet Spare. The debate in Britain over whether Muslim women should be allowed to wear a full veil in public has been reignited by recent comments made by a UK judge, a higher education college, and Home Office Minister Jeremy Brown. The Liberal Democrat MP told a newspaper that Britain should consider banning the niqab, which is a full-face veil that only allows a narrow slit for the eyes. And recently, a judge in London ruled that a Muslim woman must remove her niqab to give evidence at a trial in court. Joining me in the studio to discuss whether women should be banned from wearing a niqab is Zara Faris, a researcher in Islamic studies. Julie Bindel, author and founder of Justice for Women, and on the telephone, Dr. Taj Hagi, the director of the Muslim Educational Centre of Oxford and an imam, and Nabella Ramdani, a French Muslim journalist who specialises in Islamic affairs. Nabila Ramdani, what do you think? Do you think that England should follow in the footsteps of France and Belgium? First of all, I have to say that I'm by no means an advocate of the full veil, but I fear that uh, by calling for such a, a veil debate effectively, as has been the case in France, which led to legislation about banning um, the full veil in public places, then the danger would be that it's used as a device uh, to attack uh, Muslims and indeed Islam. And I personally feel that, you know, we're dealing with such a tiny minority of women wearing the full veil that the danger is that the debate will be hijacked and in the way that it might lead to a law in the UK that could um, stigmatize and indeed criminalize uh, Muslim and Muslim women in particular, who are in the end uh, de- modest, uh, devout uh, women. And I think it's not in line at all with the tradition of the UK being a tolerant and indeed a, a liberal country where the live uh, uh, and let live principle um, is predominant. And that's why it's so astonishing that this call for a debate should have been initiated by a liberal uh, Democrat. And it would be seen in the UK as a sinister intrusion of the state into religious uh, matters. And I think by uh, Jeremy Brown, the MP calling for that debate, assumes an awful lot of things when he says, for example, that um, uh, women are uh, forced uh, into uh, wearing it. Um, you know, I have spent an awful lot of time, for example, in France talking to women, and that is an assumption that has no statistical basis whatsoever. So not only there's an awful lot of assumption behind his call for a veiled debate, but also the... The, the, the pretext of liberating allegedly oppressed women from their alleged male oppressor is a spectacular display of false logic because by effectively calling for a legislation which will ban the wearing of the full veil in public spaces, you will effectively being, uh, be, uh, you will be putting these women under house arrest. So that's a very spurious uh, and indeed dangerous argument. Well, I think I'm going to come to you next when Julie Bindle, author and founder of Justice for Women. Where do you stand on the debate surrounding the veil? Uh, I guess to sort of follow on from what Nabila Ramdani says there, that the debate is being taken over by it becoming a, a more feminist debate. Well, quite frankly, I think if these Liberal Democrat men uh, want to do something about the oppression of women uh, in any culture. They should get their own house in order. We've heard lots about how they have turned a blind eye to women being sexually harassed and worse in the party. And I think that's a really important point to make. And I certainly think that many Muslim women have been silenced in this debate. Um, I, as a feminist, consider the full veil to be an insignia of women's oppression in the same way as I consider um, women of, uh, you know, religious Jewish origin um, who are are made to wear thick tights in the screaming heat um, uh, and to cover their hair in case their men, you know, feel... Um, sexually uh, distracted by them to also be an oppression and so do I consider uh, the nun's habit to be an insignia of women's oppression so for me it's not about protecting religion as though it is sacrosanct and as though you know we're not allowed to to point the finger and say there's something pernicious going on here about women's rights because certainly there is in every single um, mainstream religion in the world women and children are oppressed by it and under it but In terms of legislation, no, it's ludicrous to suggest that we can legislate against women wearing the full face veil. Um, If we look at what happens in courts, 
if the woman is a witness to a crime, then she can be behind a screen. Uh, many women who do not wear the uh, the, the, the face veil who are not of Muslim origin choose not to give evidence in sight of the jury and the judge so there is a precedent for that so I think that's a disingenuous reason but you know I do think that we need to look at why women are required to cover in every religion whether it is orthodox Jewish women who are supposed to shave their hair and wear a wig so that their husbands aren't distracted when they're studying or whether it's Muslim women who are required to cover from head to toe in case men get sexually frustrated at not being able to touch them. Now, surely that is saying that men cannot control their sexual desire, which I don't believe. But it's also saying something about the control of women. When I see men, um, Arabic men, um, with women wearing the full face veil in Regent's Park in London, for example, enjoying the sun, where the men are in shorts and vests and the women are covered in head to toe, then I do see it as, as a symbol of women's oppression, certainly. Zara Faris, where do you stand on this issue? I think a lot of Muslim women are incredibly frustrated that they themselves tend not to be a part of this discussion at all. Um, this is manifested as a kind of xenophobic and sadistic crusade against Muslim women and their right of conscience. It imagines at the heart of this that Muslim women are incapable of thinking for themselves, that they have no control over their lives and that they're constantly told what to do by men or other people. In reality, a lot of these women fight against the current, particularly in the UK and the US, to choose to wear the veil. A lot of them are converts to Islam. Um, so to suggest that they are uh, all coerced to do so is an erroneous assumption to begin with. And then to go on and say from that, uh, from that assumption that uh, religion is therefore coercive and it's um, objectifying of women and it takes away their personhood um, is to deny those very women their own voices in the subject. Obviously, you don't think the state should impose their views on what Muslim women do and in what way personally do you think that this debate affects Muslim society in Britain? Well essentially what you're doing and what, what happens as a result of this is that the, the, the niqab or the veil, it then becomes a tool of oppression because women then, when they go out, they do feel demonised, they do feel stigmatised, uh, they do feel more like um, they are posing some kind of imposition on society when all the voices around them are constantly um, giving off this narrative. And in particular, um, I, I do find it very strange that uh, particularly the feminist ideology, which claims to be uh, an advocate for women's right to determine their own uh, uh, their, their own lives and and uh, uh, and their own freedom of conscience can then turn around and say, well, do you know what? I don't think you know what's good for you. I'm going to tell you how you should and should not practice or manifest your religion. Essentially, it's saying, uh, don't be compelled by religion or the men of your culture. Be compelled by feminist ideology instead. Well, before I come back to you, Julie, I'm going to bring Dr. Taj Hagi into the discussion. I wondered if you could let us know what your thoughts were on Britain possibly banning the veil in public places. The niqab. Well, firstly, I think we need to be quite clear about um, terminology. This, uh, I don't call it a veil, it's a mask. It's a face mask. And we need to ask ourselves, where does this idea of face masking come from? Is it uh, Quranically based? Is it from the Quran? Or is it a cultural thing? Now, many people, Muslims included, don't know that it is a device, a, uh, a mask, that was first introduced by Cyrus the Great during the Persian uh, Empire and then spread to Byzantium and which was later then incorporated into Muslim culture and society. It has nothing to do with the Quran. This is the first thing. Now, if you ask these people, especially converts, and one of you speakers mentioned about converts, now converts unfortunately have a tendency of the new, the new Catholic becoming more Catholic than the Pope. And uh, whether it's born Muslims or convert Muslim women or who adopt the face mask, they cannot claim it is religious. They, at best, they can claim it's cultural. They have no evidence from the Quran that it is a requirement. The word burqa, niqab is not even there. For them to come out and say this is a religious requirement is both deceitful and du duplicitous. Because, for example, the, one of the highest ranking um, uh, 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 scholars in the Islamic world, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Antawi from Al Azhar University, considered to be the bastion of Sunni Islam, he himself has ruled that the burqa, the niqab, the face mask, has nothing to do with our religion. Now, I don't care if people want to wear this thing, 
this tribal rag, as I call it, but then they have to be clear that this is their culture, it's a custom, but they cannot, under any circumstances, say it's religious, because that is a lie, and we shouldn't tolerate that lie. And I think, you know, when, if they come up to us and say, listen, I'm doing this because it's cultural, I, th- I think they will be laughed out of town, so to speak. But because they come up to us and say it's religious, uh, uh, British uh, se- uh, sensibilities and sensitivities, they retreat from that uh, 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 and, and, and allow it to go. Now, I'm against the niqab, the face of a mask, for fair various reasons. First reason, it, it is, uh, I, I speak as an academic and theologian, it is not in the Quran. There are some uh, fleeting references to it in the Hadith, the so-called uh, supposed uh, 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 sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad recorded, compiled 250 to 300 years after his death, but it's got nothing to do with the Quran itself. Uh, Britain should bite the bullet here. You know, I've been calling for this for uh, a loud to, to, to 10 years, that we should ban it way before France came and, and Belgium came along. It came along. We, why are we afraid? For example, this is a gender equal society. How come I cannot wear a balaclava and go down the high street or go to a bank or wherever? I would be arrested. But somehow for a woman that's fine on the basis of saying that that's a religion. Either we are gender equal society whereby everyone can uh, uh, cover their faces or, or no one. We, we can't have it both ways. Thank you, so Dr. Taj. Thank you. Now, Z- Zara Faris. Um, yeah, I just want to say that uh, uh, Taj Hagi's nonsensical spiel about why it's not in accordance with his, his own personal interpretation of Islam is frankly irrelevant. I can invent a new religion right now called Burkism and it, um, you know, a, a compulsion of that religion is that I have to cover my face. It's completely irrelevant to this discussion whether it's an interpretation of Islam or not. That will be my right of conscience and that will be my religion. Even under an Islamic um, uh, code, you are duty bound to respect a difference of opinion including other religions. Um, And uh, I think um, uh, Taj actually has uh, much more in common um, with the Taliban than he'd like to admit in that they both want to dictate what women should be wearing and shouldn't be wearing. You did mention uh, Dr Huggy, it was more about um, the religious sort of choice to wear it. You didn't touch on a personal choice there. Any idiot can invent a religion like Burkism or whatever, but Islam doesn't allow that. Islam says the Quran is the final uh, arbiter regarding what is religion. So yes, some idiot like this woman can go and invent Burkism, that's fine. That's completely totalitarian and Islam would actually reject your your way of belief and I can't believe that you are actually an imam of a mosque and you're actually a leader of people. (laughs) <laughs> the Quran is very specific as what is required. So if it's irrelevant. Says, Islam has a duty to respect the, Christians, the, the, to respect the Jews, to respect Zoroastrians, to respect required. any now, other religion. Now, time. now, now, now <laughs> if, if women are banned from wearing the face mask at the Hajj during the pilgrimage, the most important, most sacred site in Islam, and if it's not required there, in fact, banned there, why do we need it here? That's and not actually accurate. Modest, actually, on the Hajj, um, no one is advised. telling them to be immodest. But the face is a facial identity marker. We only know who someone is on the basis of their face. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Juliet Spare. Joining me for a debate on whether Muslim women should be banned from wearing a niqab in Britain is Dr. Taj Hagi, director of the Muslim Educational Centre of Oxford, Nabil Randani, a French Muslim journalist who specialises in Islamic affairs, Zahra Faris, a researcher in Islamic studies, and Julie Bindle author and founder of Justice for Women. You know, the attitude uh, of of Taj, absolutely abhorrent. He sounds more like a men's rights activist uh, and a patriarch. I think the many of those that advocate uh, the wearing of the, the full face veil, which I find abhorrent. I find the idea that women's bodies are covered to prevent men's sexual desire abhorrent. And I say this across every single religion. I do not single out Islam for that criticism. But what we have in the West, what we have in the South, in every single nation and country in the world is, I'm afraid, what is a cliche now, but it still stands true, the madonna whore dichotomy, where women are policed for what we wear constantly. If women go out in short skirts, if women go out showing too much cleavage, too much flesh, then they are seen to be 
digressing from patriarchal rules and in fact are punished by sexual violence, are punished by being called slags, sluts, whores, etc. And similarly, if women choose to wear religious artefacts, whether it is the nun uh, in, in, in her full regalia, uh, the Jewish woman who covers her hair or the Muslim woman with the full face veil, then similarly they're picked over and policed by male patriarchs, whether they're in the Lib Dems or whether they are such as your previous guest. But what I think that we need to look at is why women's appearance and why women's clothing is constantly policed and constantly being viewed and positioned as to blame for men's sexual violence and sexually inappropriate behaviour. That, to me, is a far more important question than whether women should be allowed, under our law, to wear what they wish. And also, why don't we concentrate on issues that affect all women? And I reject the term harmful cultural practice because that sounds as if um, the only violence towards women is committed by men out there from different cultures to white Western cultures. Um, you know, why aren't we looking at the women who are killed um, on a weekly basis by men in domestic violence relationships? Why don't we call them honour killings? Why are we so complacent about convicting those that carry out female genital mutilation in this country uh, of young women, of girls? So they're more pressing uh, answers as, as a feminist that I'd like to hear. Nabila Ramdani, as someone who has gone through the changes in France, where would you agree at this point in this debate? Well, I, I think that the, um, the, the language of, of racism and stigmatization, it, uh, especially when it relates to uh, Muslim communities, is acceptable in France in a way that it is not in Britain. And I think that through allowing a veiled debate, the UK will become more and more uh, like France. And um, uh, I think that, that it has to be emphasized that the law in France the so-called burqa ban, has been a massive failure, and it remains a very divisive issue. It pits communities against each other over what's in the end, in my view, a very petty matter, and it led to national identity debates, for example, being organized in town halls, in cities, and the Interior Minister's website was also open for the public to post comments, and it effectively led to bigots posting comments such as, to be French is to eat pork, do it, drink wine, and not to wear a burqa, and that that's on a government website, no less. And there are many uh, people wearing the garment, and these women are pretty, uh, they advance pretty, um, there are not many pe women wearing the garment, and they, these women advance pretty fair reasons for, for wearing the full veil. And in the end, it's up to them to decide what to wear. I think the, the argument, uh, which has, again, no statistical basis, that um, men are imposing uh, the burqa on them is it, spurious. It's misguided, and it helps perpetuate the myth of the sinister Muslim male figure lurking in the background, telling women what to do. Um, but, but on a practical basis, I think what is certain is that in France, politicians have used very minor cases of women wearing the burqa to stigmatize Islam. And France... Uh, Effectively, what the debate has done in France is to take the dressing habit of a tiny minority of women and made out that Islam is an antisocial uh, religion and incidents of women being attacked and assaulted <clears throat> for wearing the niqab um, spiraled uh, with people taking the law into their own hands uh, and attacking women who wear the full veil or indeed the headscarf, which is not banned by law. And it has to be said that the media in France also were used to create the illusion of dark, faceless, bogey women destroying the very fabric of French society, and that is absolute uh, nonsense. So you're saying that actually... Th by continuing with the debate in the UK, we're following in France's footsteps quicker than we thought. The effect of um, imposing such a ban means that a lot of women that do go around uh, with their daily business, they go to school, they go to you know the doctors, they go um, and run their daily errands, will effectively um, be unable to do so. They will then be a victim of oppression in the fact that the, the niqab or the, the face veil then does become a tool of oppression, but not by Muslims, by a state instead. Um, and I also think, just to come back to something that Julie said earlier, I don't think that abhorrence of something is, a, is really an intellectual argument for the reason why something should be banned. I mean, we find a lot of different things abhorrent personally 
some things are not in, in tune with our own tastes, that doesn't necessarily mean that the state should then, or I know you don't think mm-hmm. that the state should legislate against them, but I don't think it's a good, um, it's a good uh, argument as to why some, you know, people should not do something. No, neither do I. I absolutely agree. I think abhorrence is, is something personal, but it's also a very political issue. And, and I do agree with, with, with Zara and Nabila on the issues that affect women. When men or when a state polices uh, our freedom of what to wear. But I also think that we should be very careful not to take this, you know, cultural relativist line, which is that, you know, we have to treat women differently from other cultures because we no longer um, in the UK and have friends have um, a society which which has uh, a regular culture and other cultures. We are all one culture that operate um, around each other and within within that that legal system, and I, I'm really concerned about people who support the normalisation of the full veil and the increased wearing of the full face veil um, as something cultural because they don't want to be labelled racist. And I'm also very concerned that within this debate, so many commentators again taking the cultural relativist line that we shouldn't criticise Islam or any religion. Um, that they conflate religion with race. You know, it, obviously we know that Muslim is not a race. It's, an, it's a religion, it's a chosen religion, it should be kept separate from the state. It is an individual person's choice. It is not the same as being attacked for being black or for being brown um, as a particular ethnicity. It is a religion. And constantly these two terms are, are, are used inappropriately. Taj Hagi then, if wearing the niqab is not dictated in your interpretation of the Quran, do you believe then, having heard the perspectives of our panel here, that the government in Britain should be the people to dictate whether women wear that niqab or not? Let me rebut your feminist participant there. I'm no patriarch. In fact, I'm the only imam in the UK to allow uh, Muslim women to lead prayers. So, I mean, I'm all for women's rights here. What I'm uh, 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 perturbed about is that when women come up with this notion that when they cover their face, they're actually doing what the Quran wants, what the religion wants. And this is uh, wrong because they've gained that perspective from who? They didn't get it from each other. They got it from male scholars over the years. So men invent this face masking thing is perpetuated by men but is practiced by women so i don't have a problem if women want to cover their faces and wear a sack all day long but they cannot be this uh, untruthful about it that's my issue do you think therefore that the the, the british government should be the people to dictate whether women should wear the niqab well you see, what, what i'm against is that I don't want to live in any society where there's public anonymity from anyone. I want to see people's faces. We are talking about the 99% of whoever will have Religion is not really a choice. Once you have conviction in something, that is for you no longer a choice. These women deliberately take this choice to cover their face and tell the society, listen, I'm a better Muslim or I'm a Muslim or whatever the case may be. My issue is why do they need external symbolism and what are the superficial symbolisms to say that they are Muslim? Can't they just be Muslim inside instead of worrying about what's on, on the outside? Okay, I mean, thank you very much. Issue. Thank you. Zara Faris. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, Taj Hagi's um, argument that, uh, you know, people should be free to do whatever they want, keep it in their home. Well, well, that sounds very much like a dictatorship where you can have any views that you want um, as long as you keep it in your home, you know. <laughs> This is not a misinterpretation. Please, it's actually, that, um, you know, it's taking your your argument to its um, absurd no, you, extremes, you which you, which it already you're is. You're distorting my <laughs> argument. Please be, be respectful about my argument. My argument is that yes, they can wear the uh, the burqa or whatever, but they cannot lie about their reasons. But because if they say this is religious, prove it. I say. Tad, did it. you did you not um, did you not stage um, a, a burqa burning celebration? Yes, because I want to say this so is So then right. it's nothing not about... So you're not because, saying that because, women because can wear it. You're actually it. making a very strong this statement that you hate Islam. it in if of it, itself, if, if, regardless if it of the justification. my faith, of course I would respect it, but it's a tribal imposition. It's, it's irrelevant. That, it, that is utterly, utterly irrelevant from whichever angle you're looking at it from, whether you're looking at it from a secular angle, in which case women, like I said, they can have whatever belief they want. Um, that is their uh, freedom of, of conscience from an Islamic perspective, you have absolutely no basis to attack 
women for wearing it and saying that they do so for whatever reason because as an imam you have a duty to protect people that have differing views from you and you unfortunately know, I have to, to I'm going to have to apologize to, to people that are hearing this and are going to get a terrible impression of Islam's uh, what you're depicting as a complete intolerance no, and that is I'm absolutely I'm unfair I'm and un- in fact it's a complete injustice the, the niqab, the burqa. I don't have a problem with that you don't seem to listen but they cannot claim to, to be It religious. doesn't matter they if can, they, what their they claim, claim is. It's cultural. They can claim it to be, cultural, they can claim it to be conventional. They can cl- claim it to be tribal. I don't have a problem with that. But they cannot sort of lie about it and say, this is my, my faith requires it. I mean, why are people afraid to hear this? For heaven's sake, whatever debate is this, we can't talk about it, frankly. Uh, if they play the cultural card or any other card, no one will take them seriously. The moment they play the religious card, people back, back off. I mean, we have to accept these things. Well, they're not backing us because they're actually discussing it at a state level. I am all for freedom of women to do to wear the bikini or the burqa. I don't have a problem either way, the bikini or the burqa. However, I'm not not going to say they can do it in the name of Islam. They're having the burqa in the name of Islam. And and, and actually, the question I but the the question I asked you initially was, you don't mind whether it's the bikini or the burqa, but do you mind if the British government are making a decision as to whether? women should be allowed to wear it or not, the niqab. We rely on the government to enforce laws. So if it needs be that we don't live in a society where anyone is anonymous in public, then yes, the government should legislate. Right. Thank you very much. Nabila, someone with, a, with retrospective ideas, where would you think this debate should go or should it just end now? The, the, the full way debate is really now picking up steam in, in the UK and this is exactly what happened in France a few years ago as the rather inconsequential issue of a few women covering the faces became a polemic about immigration and indeed integration. And it's no coincidence that the veil debate is taking shape in Britain alongside worries about increased immigration. Uh, Let's not forget that the Romanian-Bulgarian influx is due in a few months' time, for example. Far-right parties are becoming more institutionalized and acceptable. So this debate is presented as a a convenient, uh, and the veil indeed is presented as a convenient problem which can be used to rally people against foreigners and, and immigrants more generally speaking. So, so I think there's a danger there of pitting communities against each other while opening a hugely divisive uh, debate which could um, give vent to all sorts of uh, hatred towards uh, figures that are perceived as alien to British society. Thank you, Nabila Ramdani there. And um, finally, from you, Zara Faris. In summation, I would say what I, what I um, asserted at the beginning, I do think, uh, much in a- agreement with Nabila, it is, um, in a way, a um, xenophobic crusade um, to undermine a religious group and, and their way of life. Um, I would also like to add something, which I didn't get to mention earlier, very quickly. Um, essentially, if those women are paying tax, you know, taxation equals representation. They have every right to, to access um, community services and live the way other people do. In the UK, we are very, very far from being an equal society. And I want to support the right of women to wear whatever they choose. But I do think that we need to look at the harm caused by major religions on women's lives. And one of the harms is, of course, women being dictated to about what they should wear, either by religious fundamentalists or politicians. That was Julie Bindle, author and founder of Justice for Women. And I'd like to thank all my guests, Dr. Taj Hagi, the director of the Muslim Educational Centre of Oxford, Nabila Ramdami, a journalist in France who specialises in Islamic affairs, and Zara Faris, a researcher in Islamic studies.